Hi everybody, welcome to, fe um, to Facebook Live this morning, to our thought for the day. Uh, how are you doing? I hope you're alright, hope you're well. Let me just get this straight so we can see what we're doing here. There we go. Um, yeah, hope you're well, hope you've uh, woke refreshed to another new day and uh, ready to worship God today, whatever God's called you to do uh, and lead you into. Um, uh, let me just check that that's okay. Yes, it is. Okay. Sorry about that. Just didn't quite have it set up properly so uh yeah welcome to this morning's thought for the day and um good to see you all last night uh those who made it onto the zoom meeting you know about 10 dozen of us maybe i don't know all together in at different times um that was great i hope it was well worth the effort it was a bit of chaos but that's okay uh we had a bit of a laugh together and and um but we could see each other and hear each other which was lovely and uh, we will do that again uh can i encourage you those of who, who didn't manage to do it this time it's not as scary as it seems and you know once you've done it once you'll 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 be absolutely fine with it, it it's okay um but um but yeah so that was good and hopefully you enjoyed wednesday in the word last night as well but we're here this morning to look at god's word again together and um so uh, i i hope you're ready for that we're looking at, at uh, exodus chapter 18 and 19 this morning <clears throat> uh, once again a big overview of what god is doing for uh, his people get re rescuing them from Egypt, rescuing them from slavery, bringing them out to worship him. Uh, and so God, we, we've seen already how God has done that, how God has shown his might and his power. And, and the whole thing is preaching a huge sermon to the world. Look, this is the God who uh, who has made you and who has called you uh, and uh, how God chose his people for himself. He's, he br brings them out of Egypt through the Red Sea. We saw the other day as well. Yesterday, we were looking at the tests that when when we journey with God, there will always be tests. We learn we learn a lot about ourselves, but we learn even more about God, and we're learning that as we go through this, aren't we, as well? And so today we we come to the camp at Mount Sinai, and uh, we'll look at that in a second. But uh, be first, we ought to come before the Lord in prayer, and ask Him just to bless our time together this morning. So let's bow our heads and let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you again. For this wonderful day another day lord when we can come and uh and uh enjoy your creation lord we thank you for the weather this looks like it's going to be good again today we pray lord that you would bless us in this day and help us lord to be a blessing to others uh lord help us to enjoy whatever we can of this lockdown situation help us to remember like we were talking last night that you work in the deserts and so you'll work in this time when it seems like not much is happening uh, and help us to look for your working in it, Lord, and to learn from you in this time. And that goes for this morning too, Lord, as we come around your word again. Help us, Lord, to feed, feast on your word this morning, to let it dwell in us and grow and, and produce the fruit that you want, Lord, a harvest of righteousness in our hearts. So give us listening ears, open hearts, Lord, this morning. Speak to our soul, souls, we pray. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, wherever we are this morning, we thank you for being with us and bringing us together. And we ask all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Exodus chapter 18 and 19. We're looking at camping out at Mount Sinai. Now, of course, this is the mountain of the Lord. Um, this is kind of, we know, again, if you've known anything about Old Testament history, you know this is a very significant moment for God's people. Um, as eventually we will see them next, uh, tomorrow, uh, yes, Thursday. St. George's Day today, by the way. Happy St. George's Day to you all. Um, but yeah, tomorrow we'll see them uh, as as they you know receive the law and the Ten Commandments and things. But today, they they arrive at Mount Sinai. It's actually a time when we we look at, um, at the whole the rest of Exodus is really them camped out here. They they, they actually were, were escaping to to the promised land where they escaped from Egypt and God was bringing them to a land flowing with milk and honey to this promised land. But they spend almost a year here at Sinai. Why would they do that? Um, why would they go? Why stop here for around a year? If you look at, if you were reading the Bible chronologically, Exodus, the rest of Exodus, Leviticus, and halfway through Numbers, is all about this time at Mount Sinai. What's going on here? Um, well, ultimately, we find the answer. If you if you've got your Bibles open, you can look at chapter nineteen. Go to nineteen first, and just go to verse four, and it says. This is when God, Moses going to the mountain, we'll come to this in a moment, but just to sort of illustrate why they're here. You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt, or I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagle's wings, and, and here's the significant bit, brought you to myself. 
See, God's purpose was always to be to create a people for himself. And that's why this is such a significant moment. This is where God has finally brought the people to assemble themselves before him at his holy mountain. At God's choosing, the place of God's choosing, the place where he says he will meet them, he meets them. And they come on his terms and he's brought them out, he's rescued them and he's brought them to himself. That's so important, isn't it? Because ultimately that's more important than the promised land. It's more important than land flow with milk and honey and a place to live and all the rest of it. And the connotations for that for us for eternity. Most important thing is we've been brought to have a relationship with God. We're rescued from our sin in order to have a relationship with God. These people were rescued from Egypt, which is a picture of our sin. And this gospel picture here that God rescues us and brings us out through a desert and into his presence. Even in the desert today that we're in today, God is with us. And we come to the mountain of God, don't we? So um, and it's a picture, of course, of Christ's death. 1 Peter, uh, we're looking at that on Sunday mornings, but Peter will tell us that God, Christ died to bring us to God. Christ was the one who brought us to God. And we often see that Moses is a, is a kind of picture, a foreshadowing of Christ, a, a very imperfect shadow of Christ in the New Testament as he leads his people. So there's lots of echoes here for the New Testament, but we don't want to jump too far ahead, really. Uh, so we need to stick with the people as they come to Mount Sinai. And this is where effectively God will marry his people, where he becomes the, the, the groom and they are his bride if you like, as he calls them to himself, as he calls to come and worship him. They come to him, he tells them and he shares his plans with them, he shares his thoughts with them and the way he wants to, how, how this relationship is going to work on the mountain top there, uh, as he sees, speaks to Moses and he speaks to the people. And so they come to God and importantly again, a God of the word, a God who speaks, a God who communicates. A God who tells us. It's not that we come and tell God how we want it to be. The only word that's worth hearing here is not what the people say to God because that's useless. It's what God says to his people. And so this in a sense is a one-sided relationship and it has to be because it's God and us. And we are sinful and he is holy. And he is majestic and we are weak. So therefore God brings his word to us. His wisdom and his word and, and everything about it. So it's kind of restoring a little bit of what was going on in Eden where God gave the word to Adam and Eve and spoke to them and said this is what you need to do. There's only this that you need to avoid and, and all the rest of it. And, and of course we know we failed. Uh, humanity failed there. Well ultimately Israel will fail too and so will we as God's new Israel. But we'll talk about that later on. But ultimately this is the relationship that God has with us. He gives us his word. He shows us how he wants us to live. His plans for us, if you like. Um, so they come to the God of his word under, to become un, come under its influence. And we commit ourselves and we make a covenant with God that we will obey him. And the covenant right the way through the scriptures, right the way through the scriptures, but particularly here in the Old Testament, is if you obey me, then you will be blessed. If you disobey me, if you walk away, then you'll be under a curse of sin and there will be problems. But you obey me completely and everything will be great. This is how I want it to be because I know what's best. And of course, Jesus says later on, if you love me, you will keep my commands. So there's, it's a principle right the way through scripture, isn't it? So anyway, that's kind of where they are this morning. Chapter 18 is really all about Moses. It's a strange chapter in a way, um, a very strange chapter. If you read chapter 18, hope you've already read it. But if you read it later on, you'll see we're going to dip into it in a minute. But it's kind of... Um, an odd chapter to be putting here and we'll see why well, we think it's perhaps here at the moment so it's all about Moses God's man for the people and then chapter 19 is all about Israel God's people for the world okay that's kind of how we're going to split it this morning um, and in chapter 18 Moses gets leadership advice basically it seems from his father-in-law Jethro and it seems a really weird thing to do you know um, you know it, a lot of commentators don't really, you read a lot of commentaries, they don't spend an awful lot of time on chapter 18, not a lot at all. What possible relevance has it got to the the exodus and everything else that's going on? Well, it's here for a reason, isn't it? And we've I've sort of t um, titled this, Moses, a man for the people, chapter 18. If you read chapter 18 and verse 1, this is what it says, put it in context. Now Jethro, priest of Midian and a father-in-law of Moses, heard everything that God had done for Moses and for his people Israel and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Everybody knew. The whole of that known world in the Middle East at that time um, knew what God had done and how Israel, those people, had escaped from Egypt. And they'd seen the, the miraculous events and everything that went surrounding that, crossing the Red Sea. Everyone knew about it. 
Jethro knew about it. Remember, Jethro was, Mo, was Moses' father-in-law. Moses had gone out to the back of the desert when he'd sinned against God, and he went out and married a shepherd girl, and his father was Jethro, and he'd lived with them for 40, 40 years with his father-in-law uh, on his estate, on his farm estate. And after 40 years, he'd left with his family to take them away, remember, to go and be the leader that God chose for Israel in this situation. Um, and so that's kind of the relationship that they have. And Jethro, it says here, was a priest of Midian, which is uh, a false, they worshipped false gods. So he wasn't a priest of God, he was a priest of Midian. That was the land where where he lived. And so he was, a, he was he, you know, he was an outsider in a sense. He didn't, he wasn't one of God's people. Okay. And he's heard about the Exodus and uh, he comes to, now to find Moses and to catch up with him and to, to see how it's all going and what have you. And so the key verses here, if you go down to verses seven and eight. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him. And they greeted each other and then went into the tent. Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done to Pharaoh and the Egyptians for Israel's sake and about the hardships they had met along the way and how the Lord had saved them. Interesting message this, isn't it? But the, the, the father-in-law, son-in-law sit down, have a fireside chat, perhaps. Uh, it may not be been a fire there, we don't know. But they're in the tent and Moses tells him what God's been doing. He tells him all the stuff, that, the amazing miracles, the amazing provi provi prov uh, prov provision uh, uh, so far, how God has led them and God has brought them out. It's all about God. But he also tells them about the many struggles and the many problems that they've had as well and how they've had to overcome them. And interesting to note here, isn't it, as an aside really, but it's the same for all of us. Moses would not have had anything much to say if it had all been really easy and he got out no problem. He wouldn't have had to tell how God overcame certain things with them and, how, and dealt with them in certain ways. He had a story to tell because of the struggles. And again, this is a principle throughout Scripture. It's a principle throughout the Bible all the way through. that We, we have a story to tell to the nations partly because we've had to go through the struggles of life. And that's part of the reason, not the whole reason, but it's part of the reason uh, and a, quite a big part of the reason why God lets us go through these things or even brings these things into our life. And again, we mentioned it a number of times already. Psalm, Psalm is my favourite Psalm, Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord while I was in the pit. He inclined and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the miry pit and gave me a place to stand, made my footsteps firm, put a new song in my mouth. And the whole reason for it was so that others will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. And that's here, this principle is here. Moses witnessing, uh, a bit of Old Testament witnessing to his father-in-law, who's, who's, who's not one of the God's people. And he's saying, look, this is what God has done. Yeah, we've had plenty of struggles, but he's given his testimony. He's sharing his faith with his father-in-law. And it's an amazing thing, isn't it, really? And then in verse nine, we see Jethro's response to all of this. Jethro was delighted to hear about the good, all the good things the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. And he said, praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh and who rescued the people from the land of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods, for he did this to those who had treated him arrogantly. Obviously Moses told him the whole story. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. So Jethro's response is, I can see what God's done. With you arrogant people, the grace he's shown you. And it's impressed him that much that he brings a sacrifice. And commentators argue about whether whether uh, Jethro became a believer or not. But I think it's quite important, this. This is part of the reason why this chapter is here. It's not just leadership advice. We'll see that as we go later on, how Moses needs leadership advice. We'll see that. But it's, And a lot of people just consign it to that's the main point of the, of, of the chapter. But actually, I think this might be it, where Jethro, an outsider, somebody who is... You know, the whole point of Israel coming and out of Exodus and everything else and, and in the future they're going to be a light to the nations and outsiders, people outside of God's kingdom are going to see that and are going to be drawn into it through the word of testimony and in a sense we have a little picture about how the church is to operate here here's what God's done with us, we'll tell you our testimony and we'll give all the glory to God, we'll tell you that it warts and all and God will, 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 will do his work in your heart. And he does it with Jethro. And Jethro becomes a believer, I, I believe. He becomes a believer. He praises the God, Yahweh. It, it, and that's the whole purpose of it all, um, of the Exodus, isn't it? And he makes a sacrifice. He's become a believer. He's an idolater. 
a person who has got another God before God, who's come to faith in God. We might not say and do it all in the right way, in exactly the way that we would do it. That's often the way when we're people who have never really been a worshipper of God or a believer, and they'll come into our churches or they'll come into faith to, to, in Christ, and they don't always do things the way we do. And it's not quite, it, it's all a bit awkward in a, in a sense. They don't say the right words because we've been brought up in it and we've been Christians for years. And yet they're coming to faith in God. And Jethro, Jethro is like that in this, in this way. Jethro... Uh, is, is, is a great example for us. Moses is a great example for us here of how God works through his church and through our witness. But then it moves on. Jethro sees Moses at work the next day and Moses on a 10 hour shift. And what he, he basically was spending his time doing was, as we read in this chapter, is that people would queue up and come with their disputes and their problems and their issues. And Moses would have to decide about what to do and interpret what God wants for them and all the rest of it. And Moses is trying to solve Israel's problems, the people of Israel's problems uh, in the queue. And Jethro comes to him and says in verse 15, this is a mess. You can't do this. It, it takes an outsider sometimes to see that. Here he comes from a completely different culture and everything like that, not worship. And he comes in, he meets God, he says, and he sees, Mo, what are you doing? This just seems weird. And sometimes we need an outsider's perspective on what we do as church and what we do as people and in our own individual lives. Why are you doing it this way? And particularly here for Moses, um, Moses trying to solve all these problems. And he says, it's not the fact that, you know, Jethro gives him advice about splitting people up and getting elders and people to look after them. And it's a, some leadership advice, delegation advice, which all good leaders need to learn. So, but, and that's what a lot of people focus on here. But the important thing is in verse 15, where he says, you can't do, you need to rethink what you're doing. But ultimately it's not because you're not organized enough. It's because you're trying to do what God should be doing. You can't do that, Moses. You're not equipped to do that. This is not what you should do. And it takes somebody outside to point this out. You can't carry all the burdens of Israel. You can't solve all the problems. All you can do is point people to God. Why don't you teach them about God so that they can find him for himself is basically what he's saying. Pastor them and look after them by teaching them about God, which is why preaching of God's word is so important for all of us as Christians, as we come to church and pastors roles like mine is to, is to teach God's word so that people themselves, because we, you know, pastors haven't got the answers. Leaders haven't got the answers. There's only one person who's got the answers and that's Christ himself. So we point people to Christ, but you know, um, Moses can never comfort people. He, he, he can't, he can't, um, he can't solve their problems. He can't solve, you know, soothe the aches of the human heart. He can't give them proper direction. He can only point them to the God who will give that, can't he? And so the idea is, Jethro says to him, teach them about God. Do what you did to me. Teach them about this God and help them to find him for themselves. It's proactive pastoring and teaching. He's, he's teaching them here. That's the point of this, 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 um, this chapter here, chapter 18. Go, we, and ultimately what it's reiterating, what we've been learning at Trinity for the past few months before we went into lockdown. We all have a responsibility for our own lives before God. We all stand before God ourselves, each individual, and we have a responsibility to listen, to learn, to grow, and become better at being disciples. Your pastors can't solve problems, can they? Uh, deacons can't solve problems, elders can't solve problems. We can listen, we can pray, of course we do that. Pray with one another, your friends can't solve problems. You need to have, it's just you and Jesus. That's what it needs to be. And so Moses, here's his advice. And, and in a sense, they've both blessed each other. You know, Jethro's blessed, Moses blessed Jethro because he's told him about God and, and, and God. And Jethro's coming to some kind of relationship with God. And now Jethro's blessed Moses by just put, by saying something that was blindingly obvious to him. And he perhaps came at it from a point of view of, you know, this is what you need to do as a leadership, it's a leadership seminar. Delegate, delegate, delegate. But in doing that, he re Moses is taught that he can't solve Israel's problems. And the people have to be in relationship to God themselves. Moses is not able to do the job. Even the greatest leader in of a million people here, around a million people now there are in the desert here, and Moses is leading these people. It takes some kind of leader to do that, doesn't it? And yes, it was a mess. And yes, he needed to delegate. That was probably all true. But ultimately, what he was trying to do was 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 be too too great and not just mediate but to actually sort all these problems out he will never be able to meet israel's needs there's too many prayers there's too many issues there's too many subjects he's human 
He's a good man, but it's not enough. Jethro's advice is helpful, but even that's not enough. Just delegating. No one can solve the problems of God's people. Only God is the God of all comforts. Only God can help to soothe the aches of an aching heart. Only God can give true, true direction. And ultimately, only God can bring salvation. Only G And of course, our leader, if you like, our mediator isn't Moses, it's Jesus today. Jesus is the one who is, is, is the, the fulfilment of all of this, as we see in the New Testament. Jesus, and it, we can go to him because he does know every one of us as his sheep. And he is able to comfort and direct and bring to salvation. That's why God sent his son. So God, we have this wonderful relationship with Christ. We don't go to a priest or to anybody else or to a pastor or to anybody. We go to Christ and we all need to learn to do that and be independent in that sense. Don't look to leaders and other people. Even the best, we look to Christ. Even the best can only point people to God. We have to wait. We have to wait to meet the real man of the people. The man of the people, the real we, it isn't Moses really, the real man of the people is Christ himself. It's just you, it's just Jesus and me, for all of us. We can all help and we can all you know, encourage and you know, in, in better times put our arm around each other and all these things. But ultimately it's between you and your relationship with Christ. You need to grow and mature and be close to him because only he can help you. And so that's what we learn from chapter 18 here, that Jesus ultimately is the man of the people. It's not Moses, right? He can't do this. Right, that's, that's the man of the people. Chapter 19, then we go near to the mountain, the people for the world. God is choosing a people to be a light to the nations. And in order to do that, they've got to be close to him. So God, he says in chapter 2, uh, in, that they're camped in front of this mountain and God is going to come down to them. They will go up, Moses will go up to the mountain a little bit, but actually God has to come down to, to us, doesn't he? We can't go all the way up to him. Incidentally, which is really quite interesting, in this not just in this chapter, but all the times that they're at Sinai, Moses climbs this mountain seven times, up and down. Uh, seven times, three times we have it here in chapter 19, verse 3, verse 8 and verse 20. Remember Moses 80, it's not bad for an 80 year old. Seven times up that mountain and back down again. This is how important it is, though, isn't it, really? We see here God's loving, and, and the picture God is giving to his people here, that he's a loving, gracious, merciful God, but he's also terrifying, frightening in his holiness. And, and it, it's funny, isn't it? That, that's the picture we get here. Um, we'll see it later on with the trumpet and the cloud and the thunder and everything else. It, it's, 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 it's an awesome sight. But today we don't see God as being terrifying, do we? we? In fact, we don't even like to talk about God being terrifying and the God of judgment and what have you. People balk at that. Even Christians find that difficult to talk about. Why? Because ultimately, I suppose it comes back to the fact that we live in days of grace, aren't we? Days of forgiveness, days of invitation, days of salvation. This is God in his kindness and his mercy looking on a world that's rejected him and calling them to himself. But there will come a day when God will be terrifying in that sense. So today is a day of grace, invitation, salvation, uh, mercy. But tomorrow will be a day of judgment. Not tomorrow, tomorrow, but you know, in the future, there will come a day of judgment. And so the picture we have of God here is it, it's, a, it's a balanced picture. We need to have a, a balanced picture of how great and big our God is if we're going to come and spend time with him and walk with him. That's what we learn here. So God is both lofty and high and mighty, but he's also close. And if all the heresies that kind of go around the earth and the, the wrong pictures of God usually come because we get one of these things or we magnify one of these things above the other. So sometimes it, we forget that how lofty he is and he becomes my mate, he becomes too pally, he palsy wally with us and everything like that. And decline and, and irreverence and all the rest of it sets in and we take God too loosely. God has risked that, in a sense, by becoming merciful and gracious and reaching out to us. But sadly, we reject him as be, uh, when we treat him as too matey and all of this. But then if we don't recognise that God is close and intimate, then all we think about is terror and fear and desperation. And we run from God in that sense. So what we need to recognise is God is both powerful and terrifying, but he's also intimate and close. 
And it's important when we do remember that, when we come to him in our relationship and best expressed in prayer, isn't it? We recognise he's big, but not distant. Uh, not distant. So we recognise the greatness of God as we come in prayer and we come with reverence. But we need to remember that he's, he's, he's intimate with us as well. The God who runs the universe and holds everything together is the God who knows the hairs on your head. You know, I, I can't really say that, can I? But he's a God who knows everything about you. He's the intimate God who's closer and can be talked to and we can enter his throne room because Christ has made a way for us there through the curtain on Calvary. But we also need to remember also that yes, he does love me and he is intimate, but he is big enough. Sometimes we can say to God, look, I know you love me and what have you, but we doubt whether he can do the things that we want him to do and, and he's in charge of things and we doubt his, his providence and we doubt his sovereignty. And we get into all kinds of trouble when we do that, particularly in times like these. And so we come to pray and, we, and, and at the back of our minds we're thinking, but is God real? Is he really big enough to deal with this? And we doubt, we might not say it out loud, but we doubt that. You know, is he big enough? Is our God too big? We talked about this already. When we think about the miracles and stuff we read in the Bible and, and we, we think of, of, of where we are now and how God is going to work this all out. And we begin to doubt, but never forget how big and terrifying and awesome God is. So we need to balance, don't we? Both of them. He's terrifyingly powerful. And it's the essence of our worship, this, as we come to God. We don't come too matey and lovingly and all the rest of it and syrupy, but we recognise he's a terrifying God as we come and approach him in worship. Um, sometimes we think our worship is just about the way we live and we, and, and it's true. Um, we've always, But we need to recognise two sides to our worship. It's about how we obey him, how we serve him, how we speak to him, but we also need to recognise the... Sp we need to get learn to be spellbound if you like that's probably not a great word is it but to be spellbound and in awe of this majestic awesome god it's the balance isn't it as we worship this god who we can be close to we can sing hymns and songs of of joy and 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 satisfaction to him but recognize and be spellbound by the amazing work of god and everybody in scripture when you read through the scriptures the psalmists and everybody when they when they meet with the living god in some way or other as we'll see here in a moment on this mountain People are, are not only in awe of him, and, but it, 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 the, the overwhelming thing is how big and majestic he is. It causes people to fall on their faces and fear in, in, in the right sort of way. Spellbound by God. And sometimes I think we've lost that in our worship. In our sung worship as well as in our life's worship. Remembering that God is big. He's awesome. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing that he cannot do. Don't dismiss that. That is so true, and we need to remember what that means. And somebody's once said, uh, we can become too casual and irreverent sometimes in our praise and our worship, can't we? And in our churches, and, and I read somewhere, somebody said about churches not shouldn't be seen as a nice, safe, peaceful little place that we go, and it's full of people with, with uh, older people with, you know, sort of, where well, there's no harm can come there. It's all very nice with our nice hats and everything else that we wear and everything else, and yet, Instead of giving the nice sort of, uh, you know, attire that we go and we, we all should be issued on the way in as we go into Trinity Church when we finally get back. People should, because it's such a safe, because God will be with us as we meet. And this awesome God, we maybe should, instead of having ordinary hats, we should have crash helmets. We should have life jackets. We should be lashed into the pews because we're coming to meet with the living God. And we see a bit of that here when we come to Moses uh, as he goes up the mountain verse 3 let's read from verse 3 Moses he goes up three times as we said in this chapter so the first time he goes up uh, here we have it in verse 3 so Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said this is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles wings and brought you to myself that's that word isn't it now if I if you if you obey me fully it's the if there if you obey me, obedience, blessing. If you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then not out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole world is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. God's laid out a story out saying, this is what's on store for you. This is what I want for you. This is what it's all been about. If you obey me and if you follow me and if you keep the covenant, then you will be above all people of the earth, my treasured possession. It's what we are this morning before God. 
And so God says, I've rescued you to Moses and tell the people I've rescued you and um, you'll be my treasured possession in order to impact the world, that you will be a light to the nations. You are my chosen instruments to go and impact the world. This is the church, folks. This is the initial, this is the infant church. It doesn't start in the New Testament. It starts here. And where God assembles his people to give them his word and tell them, this is what you're about. You are my treasured possession. I love you. You're part of my, I'm making my covenant with you. I'm ratifying it here on this mountain. And what I want from you is to just obey me so that you will be, as you live and go out into the world, a light to the nations. The whole world will know because I've chosen you. It doesn't hang on our faithfulness to him. It hangs on his faithfulness to us because he uses that word, if you obey me. God knows very well that we're going to fail. Israel failed and we fail. But he knows that. But he says, if you obey me, this is the, this is the crux of it all. And you're not going to be able to do that. There's a, there's a condition. The second time Moses goes up, verse 8, describes God. And, and this is the awesome God we were talking about a moment. This is the God you're coming to. Okay, remember this. Uh, second, the people all responded together. We will do everything, verse 8. The Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. So their people have said, yes, we want you to reign. And we've seen what you've done. We've seen how you've provided. We want you. So that's our offer. When we, we see what Christ offers us, what God offers us in Christ, we, oh, it's hard for us not to say yes, is it? Of course we will. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking and you will... Uh, with you and will always put their trust in you then Moses told the Lord what the people had said and the Lord said to Moses go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow make them wash their clothes and be ready on the third day because on that day the Lord will come down on the Mount Sinai in the sight of the people put limits of, for the people around the mountain and tell them be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it whoever touches the mountain will be put to death God is impressing on them his holiness and his otherness. He's bigger and he's greater. He'll speak to his servant Moses. He'll do it in a dense cloud. I want everyone to see that there's a relationship here. But don't take me for granted. And be careful how you approach me. God is terrifying. Take care. Be prepared to meet me. Be prepared in the way that you do things. This is the, the, the balance, as we say, the loving, intimate God. But he is God presenting himself as somebody terrifying in this way. Nothing can prepare them for this. Moses goes up again in verse 20 and God repeats the warnings to him. So he says it twice. He wants to be close, but he's frighteningly holy. Remember who we're dealing with. This is the God, the picture of God we're getting here. We have a great, you know, we have a great privilege to be called into God's presence. Out of all the people in the world, I will call you. And you, sitting there this morning, have been called into God's presence. What a privilege to this God who is able to do everything and anything isn't he um ultimately we know that they never succeed in becoming this holy nation uh, this kingdom of priests they failed um could, but the, the question that's, that's why god used the word if how could they ever succeed it's too great a job it's too great a responsibility isn't it how will we ever succeed in being the christians and the lights to the nations that god wants us to be to be the church that god wants us to be well of course the answer is jesus he came and became, he becomes that one nation. He becomes the nation who is the holy nation. He is the Israel, if you like, the new Israel. He is the one who leads people uh, and, and who is, becomes a light to the nations. And we proclaim him, not ourselves. We're not the light to the nations. He is. We will always fail. So he comes and makes it possible for us to be holy on the cross. What an answer for the gospel. God always had this answer in mind. Jesus, a light to the nations. He creates a new nation. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9, we'll see that in a couple of Sunday mornings as we come, is we are a holy nation, Peter says, a royal priesthood, um, a chosen race. We are the ones that God is talking to here. He, he interprets what happens on, in Exodus for us. And Peter uses a lot of Exodus imagery in his, his letter, as we'll see uh, in the next couple of weeks. You are a holy nation, a royal priesthood. You're meant to be a light to the nations. You will fail, but we have Jesus. That's why we have him. And so the writer to the Hebrews, as we'll finish this morning, uh, if you want to turn to this, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 18 and following, and he remembers this, he's looking back and he's explaining to the people who are believers. And he says, remember Israel in the wilderness? Remember the mountain? Remember what happened? And this is what he says. You haven't come to a mountain, but Christ. 
You've not come to a, this is verse 18 of Hebrews 12. You've not come to a mountain that cannot be, that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom and storm as they did. To a trumpet blast or with such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. How holy God is. It, 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 if even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. That's what God had said. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Moses is one of the brave, he, Moses is meek, and he's not, you know, he, he describes himself as that, doesn't he? I think he's one of the bravest people in the Bible. There's this mountain fizzing and, and burning with fire and thunder and trumpet and God's booming voice and cloud. And Moses, God calls Moses up and Moses went up. How brave is that? It's a desire to be in God's presence. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But, and here's the deal, you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, up to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. But ultimately to Jesus, the mediator, not Moses, Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Uh, it, there's a lot we could say about that. In other words, and then it goes on to say, see to, see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. Don't miss Jesus in all of this. This is who we have. You know, for this, we have Jesus. Chapter 18 tells us this morning that only Jesus can meet our needs. We, we, we can't look to leaders. We can't look to other people. We need to be able to go to God. And we do that through Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. Only he can meet our needs. We have to develop and work to develop our relations with him. Chapter 19 tells us only Jesus is the message that we can bring to the nations. We haven't got anything. We've got a testimony, but it's all about him. Just as Moses said to Jethro, it's all about God. So don't try to be good and impressive. Sometimes when we, we hear sermons, we think we need to go away and work harder and be better and do more. No, just trust in Christ. Go to him. Jesus has made the way for you to be a light to the nations. Proclaim Jesus in your worship, in your life, in the way that you live, in the things that you say, in the way that we act during this lockdown period. Jesus made a way for us to be a light to our community, to impact the world around us. God gave the Israelites the, the, the law and, and, and the relationship with them so that they would be his people to impact the world around them. Um, God, that law has been fulfilled in Christ. He's the obedient one, so we proclaim him. He is the way to, to God. So we live for him. Point people to Jesus, who, according to our titles this morning, he is the man for the people and the man for the whole world, isn't he? makes us the people that we can witness to the whole world well i hope that's been again helpful for you this morning as we've come around god's word together um lots to learn and lots to think about perhaps you to just dwell on that a little bit this morning but remember the god who is who is majestic and holy but also intimate and personal and he becomes even more personal because of christ who brings us to him through the cross and so let's give thanks for that this morning as we pray and finish our time together lord we thank you for your word to us again today we thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Father, that you sent him into this world. And we thank you, as we've just celebrated, for his death and resurrection. We thank you, Lord, that he has made a way for us to, to come to you and worship you in the beauty of your holiness and the awesomeness. Help us, Lord, to remember how terrifyingly holy you really are and how big you are for everything that we're in at the moment. And, Lord, help us to remember how intimate you are with us, how much, how gracious, how merciful. Lord, help us to remember Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Help us to remember what he's done for us. Help us to be always thankful for what you've done for us, Lord Jesus. Help us, Lord, to, to uh, live that life that glorifies you because of Jesus. And when we fail, that we come back to him. Lord, help us to be not irreverent, but reverent of you and all that you've done. Help us to live a life that glorifies you. And help us to come to the God of the word and obey him, his commands. Lord, we pray for all these things this morning, that we might impact our world around us. And we ask this for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Great. Thank you for joining me. Hope that's been good today. Have a great day in the sunshine. It looks like it's going to be a very warm one today, so enjoy it. Put your sun cream on. I think I got a bit burnt yesterday. 
Um, we, I will email you, not today, but probably tomorrow, and we'll talk more about what we're going to do over the weekend. Uh, I think we need to redo the, we need to have another go at fate at, uh, at Zoom. I think that was great last night, uh, a good first try. We'll do it again. If you didn't get involved last time, yeah, I'll send you the link and we'll explain that as we go along. Um, but it, you know, it's definitely worth it. It's lovely to see everybody again. Um, and uh, and yeah, so for today, just just uh, follow the Lord, listen to what God has said. Have a great day, um, and I'll I'll see you tomorrow morning, eight thirty, if you're up and about. Otherwise, later on on YouTube. God bless. Have a lovely day.